Would you give a hand for the worship team? They did an amazing yeah, they did. job, didn't they? They sure did. Praise the Lord. Well, we just want to keep that spirit of worship going right now. So please, please, please sing with us. Don't just look at us, you know. <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, this morning, you guys know our testimony about how uh, God called us way back. Uh, in 2009 to go and just try to be aggressive with the gospel, to live like we're in the last days. Amen. And so this message I'm going to share this morning is a last day's message. And so I'm going to start with a last day's song, a song called Jesus is Coming Soon, Even So Come. So let's worship him together. Feel free to stand if you like, just however, just worship with us.
give life You I love You bring light to the darkness You give hope You restore Every heart that is broken Great are you, Lord You give life You are love You bring light to the darkness You give hope You restore Every heart that is broken Great are you, Lord You're the breath in our lungs So we pour out our praise Pour out our praise It's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise to you only. You give life, you are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope, you restore every other is broken. Great are you, Lord. It's your breath in my lungs. So we pour out our praise, pour out our praise. It's your breath in my lungs. So we pour out We'll shout your praise Our hearts will cry These bones will sing Great are you, Lord And all the earth will shout your praise Our hearts will cry These bones will sing Great Pray. Father, we adore you this morning. We love you. We thank you for air in our lungs today, God. It's the, it's the awesome many blessings that you give us all the time that we forget to thank you for, Lord. But we are grateful today. And I pray, God, that you, you brought people, Father, with ears to hear and hearts to receive, God. May your word just be delivered today. Father, I pray for Travis as he delivers it, God. I just pray for your anointing power on um, for his uh, conveyance to be clarity, God. I pray for it to come across well. I pray that you would give him confidence in your word, Lord, to speak it well and to not speak his ideals or uh, theology, God, but that it would be completely your word 
pure as it is, God. Um, please don't leave us the same, Father. Challenge us today. Teach us, yes. Lord. So we just pray your blessing over this service, Lord. And we do. We just dedicate it all to you. Have your way, Father. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. 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 Well, you may be seated. Thank you, Don. Our God is good. Amen. Amen. Well, it is such a blessing and a privilege to be here. I mean, I know this is home church and we get to go to a lot of places, but I love being here with you all more than anywhere else. So thank you so much for letting us just share this morning. Thank you for this privilege and opportunity to dig into God's Word. So if you would, open your Bibles and go ahead and open up to 2 Kings chapter 23. Again, that's 2 Kings chapter 23. I believe the words will be on the screen as well, but we have Bibles. Let's use them, right? <laughs> 2 Kings chapter 23, and we'll start in verse 29 this morning. We're going to be kind of all over the place in 2 Kings. Um, and so just to begin, kind of share a couple things. I wanted to start out first with some really happy news or a happy thing to kind of share with you, and then a very sobering thought to give you. And the happy news I want to share right off the bat is Allegra and I, you know we have our three little ones, uh, but God is blessing us, and in July we're going to be expecting our fourth little one. So praise the Lord. And thank you guys so much for clapping, because it's so weird. When you get to your fourth child, you say, hey, we're expecting. There's a lot more people like, oh, I'm sorry. You know, like, <laughs> it was a blessing the first time, still a blessing, praise the Lord. But I want to start with a sobering thought as well, because like I had said earlier, what God has called us to do with our ministry is we travel across the country, we go to prisons and recoveries. What God has prompted us with, it prompted us with is that we're in the last days and we need to live like it. That time is short and Jesus is coming soon. Amen? And with that whole last days thought, I want you to just ask yourself a question. Imagine this. What would you do if you found out and you knew with assurance that in the next 12 years that the United States of America would be totally destroyed. It wouldn't be anything like it is right now. That Washington, D.C., in 12, 20 years, would be absolutely ransacked, it would be burned down, and all the people left in America would either be killed or taken captive. If you knew that was a reality, that God's judgment was coming in that way, how would you respond? What would you say? What do you think God would put on your heart to share with this world around you? Right now in the scripture, we're going to look at that same scenario that happened, not in America, but happened in the Bible to the kingdom of Judah. And what we're going to look at in the story, to give you kind of my quick outlines, we're going to look at two different kings, two different last days kings, if you will. Two of the last kings in the king of, kingdom of Judah and the kingdom of Judah at this time was a very, very wicked nation. They were a nation that did some horrible things. They worshipped other gods. They worshipped idols. They killed babies. This was the time in Judah's history where Judah was actually the people that were, that were worshipping these false gods. Even the leaders, the kings of their country, were taking little babies and burning them alive to these false gods. And God was fed up with it. He was tired of it. And his judgment was about to come. And so my outline, if you will, we're going to look at two different kings in the story. And in this story, we're going to see three different mysteries. Three different Bible mysteries that have confused people, even me, for years and years. And we're going to look at three last days lessons. Three things that I believe God wants us to think about in the last days of our world. And how we can shine for him. Amen? So with all that being said, let's go ahead and read the first verse that we're going to talk about. And again, we'll go over lots of different scriptures today to kind of bring continuity to the story. But in 2 Kings chapter 23, verse 29, it says, While Josiah was king, Pharaoh Necho, king of Egypt, went up to the Euphrates River to help the king of Assyria. King Josiah marched out to meet him in battle, but Necho faced him and killed him at Megiddo. Let's go ahead and stop here, and let's pray. Father God, I just thank you so much for this privilege to dig in your word, God, and I pray you would stir our hearts with what you want to say to us. Stir our hearts for how we need to live and what message we need to bring to this lost and dying world around us. God, as we dig into all these scriptures, these kings, and the things that took place, God, I pray that you would bring clarity, God, that we'd 
be able to see your heart and your love toward us through all of this. And so, God, we just ask you to take over, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, in 2 Kings chapter 29, while, the king Jos- while Josiah was king, Pharaoh Necho, king of Egypt, went up to the Euphrates River to help the king of Assyria. Now, like I said earlier, we're going to have two different kings that we're going to look at at this story. And if you read this whole passage from chapter uh, Kings chapter 23 to the end of the chapter 25, if you read that whole thing, there's probably about four or five different kings that happen. But we're going to hone in on two of those kings. And the first king that we're going to talk about is the king Josiah. Now, how many of you guys have heard of Josiah? One of the more favorite, famous kings in the Bible. Raise your hand if you know Josiah. I just want to kind of get an idea. Okay, um, for those of you that don't know a lot about Josiah, Josiah is probably one of the most remarkable kings in the Bible. Because if you study the books of Kings or Chronicles, you'll notice that they'll say there's this king, and they'll say he did evil in the sight of the Lord. All right? And then the next one, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord. And you have that over and over and over again, right? Well, Josiah is one of those very, very few kings where it doesn't say that. That he was a king that actually did remarkable and awesome things for God. And to give you the quick backstory on King Josiah, uh, King Josiah's dad was Ammon. His grandfather uh, was a guy named Manassas, who literally was a, basically a wizard. He was a witchcraft person. He was one of those people that burned one of his own children to death, worshiping his false god. And then when Josiah became king, he came, became king after his dad was killed. And he became king when he was eight years old. <laughs> Pretty young king, right? And when he grows up, for some reason, he falls in love with God. And he turns his heart over to him. And at one point, and while he was young and he was growing up, somebody brought him one of the last books of the law, last Bibles that they had. They found it in the kingdom. And they read it to the young King Josiah. Now, at this point, he was probably his early 20s, something like that. Maybe an older teenager. And when they read it to him, it broke his heart. He ripped his clothes and he repented for all the wrong that he had done, for all the wrong that the nation of Judah had done. And just totally turn things around. And after that, he went out and he went to all the places where this pagan worship to these false gods and this baby killing was happening. And he tore those altars down. He executed the people that were doing it. And it, it was just this amazing thing. It kind of be like if we had a president of our country that went out and all of a sudden they banned Muslims from coming into our country. Sorry to bring it to that. But they, they, they try to get rid of some of the idol worship. If we, like, we had a leader that came and did everything he could to end abortion. It'd be like that. So he was making these incredible reforms. And what happened, if you can turn back with me just one chapter to chapter 2 Kings chapter 22, verse 18, is that God was so impressed by the turning around of King Josiah's heart that he sent a prophet to him to give him a very special special message, a very special prophecy. And in 2 Kings chapter 22, verse 18, it says, Tell the king of Judah who sent you to inquire of the Lord, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says concerning the words you heard. Because your heart was responsive and you humbled yourself before the Lord when you heard what I have spoken against this place and its people, that they would become accursed and laid waste, And because you tore your robes and wept in my presence, I have heard you, declares the Lord. Therefore, I will gather you to your fathers, and you will be buried in peace. Your eyes will not see all the disaster I'm going to bring to this place. So because Josiah repented and he turned his heart to God, God sent a prophecy to him through the prophet Huldah, a woman prophetess, actually. And He brings this prophecy and says, because you've turned your heart to me, you're going to die in peace. You're not going to die in war and see all this horrible stuff happen, but you're going to be given grace. Praise the Lord for that grace. Amen? But all of this, all this good we see happen here, brings me to where we just have been in 2 Kings chapter 23. And I'm going to read again in verse 29. It says, while Josiah was king, Pharaoh Necho, king of Egypt, went up to the Euphrates River to help the king of Assyria. King Josiah marched out to meet him in battle, but Necho faced him and killed him at Megiddo. And the first mystery of my scripture here is, why did this just happen? Think about it. We have a godly king, 
who's leading the nation in a righteous and wonderful way, right? And now, he's just done these reforms, and what happens right after that? He gets killed. He gets murdered. And if you read the parallel version of this in Second Chronicles, it's this very dramatic story. It says that Josiah heard that the king was coming of Egypt, the king of Egypt, the pharaoh was coming, and he went out to, to stop him on his path, and it says that the king of Egypt said, why are you trying to get in my way here? I'm not coming to attack you, but I'm coming to attack Babylon. I'm going to join Assyria and attack Babylon. God told me to do this and to do it quickly. If you get in my way, you're obstructing what God is doing. And we get this big, big picture here. But Josiah goes out, and he's murdered, and he's struck by an arrow, and he dies. Now, my question is, why did this happen? Well, I have two different answers. And the first answer is the fact even though Josiah was seeking God, the people, his nation, were not. The people were still rebelling against God, and they were fighting the reforms he was doing. And my point with, of this is that you can't lead people where they don't want to go. And even if we get the most godly leader you can hope for, if people's hearts don't change, it's not going to change the direction and it's not going to put off the judgment that's coming. Give me an example. Right now, we have some leaders in our office. Some of them people like, some people hate. I'm not going to go political. This isn't my point. But a lot of those leaders are trying their very best to make some godly reforms. They're doing things to end abortion, to get in the way of homosexual marriage, to do things to draw us back to him. And what's amazing me at this point in history is that our country is fighting it. Like, we haven't fought anything else in this world. The people that are against it are fighting it a lot harder than Christians have been fighting for change a lot of times. And it's tragic. And even though God's blessing us with some moral leadership, if we don't change the direction we're going as a people, the judgment will still come. Amen? And that's what happens here. Even though Josiah is seeking God, the people aren't. And so that judgment still has to come. The second answer to this question, because you can say, well, yeah, the people deserve that judgment, but why did Josiah have to die? He was a righteous guy, right? That's a really good question. But the reason that Josiah himself died, I believe, is because Josiah ignored the word of God, and he didn't respond to God when he gave him the opportunity. Two different things. First of all, I talked about Pharaoh Necho in the story in 2 Chronicles about how the Pharaoh came and said that he knew that God told him to go and attack Babylon. And Josiah went and got in the way of it. Josiah got this word, but he didn't respond to God's word. Beyond that, Josiah should have known and most certainly known that according to the scripture, the nation of Babylon was the one that was going to come and get him. That it wasn't Egypt, it wasn't Assyria. But God said since Hezekiah, a king about four generations ago, that Babylon was going to come. And do you realize the irony here that when Josiah went and attacked Egypt, which God had told to go and attack Babylon, what he did is he got in the way of God's plan. That he actually made it easier for Babylon to come and invade Judah. That by attacking him, he slowed down the Pharaoh of Egypt so that he couldn't unite with the king of Assyria. And because of that, Babylon invaded very quickly. Isn't that ironic? God was actually giving them grace, I believe. He was actually going to postpone that judgment a little longer. And yet, because Josiah wouldn't listen to God, he wouldn't respond to the prophecy, and he wouldn't respond to the word of the Lord that came through Pharaoh Necho. He put him in a situation that he shouldn't have, and because of that, he died. Well, now let's go back to our mystery, though, right? The prophecy that we read about said that Josiah was going to die in peace, right? That's what God said. You're going to die in peace. You're not going to see this destruction. Now, why did that happen? Because I know you can make the case that, well, maybe dying in a battle and being shot with an arrow and suffering all day long wasn't as bad as being a city under siege and seeing everybody die around you. I, I see how you can make that case. But any way you spin it, I don't see that as dying in peace. <laughs> why did that happen? This is a mystery here. Was God's word wrong? No, God's word is right. And the truth, the last day's lessons, I believe God wants us to see in this scenario is this. 
Josiah wouldn't respond to God. And here's the truth, is that God is able to adjust his response to us based on our response to him. God is able to adjust his response to us based on our response to him. Now, I know that's probably a heavy thing to throw at some people, but it's biblically true. And I wouldn't say it unless I could prove it upside down, backwards in the Bible. Let me give you a couple examples. Do you guys remember Jonah in the Bible? And the Ninevites, right? God sent Jonah to the Ninevites to tell them, I am going to destroy this city. 40 days, or he went through the city three days instead of 40 days, I'm going to destroy all of this, right? God said that. That was the word of God, right? Did God do it? No, he relented. He gave him grace. That prophecy was there. But God, because they turned their hearts, they responded to God, he adjusted how he responded to them. Another example. Uh, do you uh, remember in the Bible there was a pharaoh and Abraham? And Abraham went in and he pretended that his wife, Sarah, was actually his sister and not his wife, right? And so Pharaoh took him as one of his wives. And then God spoke to Pharaoh and says, because of what you've done, you're a dead man. You're going to die. God told him he was going to die, right? He repented. He made things right. Did God kill him? No. He gave him grace. You see this happen over and over again through the Bible. King Hezekiah, God told him, get ready. You're going to die. He repented. He, he tore his clothes. He repented of his pride. He turned his heart to God. God gave him 15 more years. God is able to adjust his response to us based on our response to him. And guys, this is a double-edged sword kind of a statement because for the sinner, that's hope. <laughs> Praise the Lord, isn't it? That even though we know we've done things that we deserve God's judgment, if we change our ways, if we repent, God still can give us grace. He can still relent and give us hope, amen? That's good news, isn't it? But it's a double-edged sword because for the saint, it's the reality that we can still receive re repercussions for our actions, amen? And that if we choose to ignore God and not listen to him, that things can go poorly for us. But that's the truth, is that God is able to adjust his response to us based on our response to him. So let's continue on. Now we're going to look at the second king in our story. And this is a king named Jehoiachim. So if you would open your Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 24, verse 8. 2 Kings chapter 24, verse 8. I'm just going to read a few verses right here. Again, one more time. 2 Kings chapter 24, verse 8. It says, Jehoiachin was 18 years old when he became king. And he reigned in Jerusalem three months. His mother's name was Neshuta daughter of El Nathan, she was from Jerusalem. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord just at his, as his father had done. At that time, the officers of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Judah, advanced on Jerusalem and laid siege to it. And Nebuchadnezzar himself came up to the city while his officials were besieging it. Jehoiakim, king of Judah, his mother, his attendants, his nobles, and his officials all surrendered to him. Now let's talk about Jehoiachin, right? So we got two kings. We talked about Josiah. This is our second king we're going to focus on. And Jehoiachin uh, actually becomes king after his dad, who was a very, very wicked, evil person, gets killed. He's actually murdered by the enemy. And so when Jehoiachin becomes king, he's just lost his dad. He's seen his dad die. And now he's 18 year old. 18 years old, he's a teenager, and he becomes king, and he inherits an absolute mess. <laughs> I mean, at this point, Babylon has taken over most of the country. Now they're besieging the capital city, Jerusalem, and they're all around it. And now, I want to tell you, Jerusalem was a city that was built to survive sieges. They had enough supplies to hang on for like two years or longer if they were ever in that situation. They could have, they could have fought back. They could have waited this thing out a little bit. And so he, he's, he's got this situation. He's, he's surrounded. He's a young king. He's probably mourning. He's probably scared. But on top of all this, he also has a lot of prophecies hanging over his head. And I just want to kind of give you a couple of those prophecies. I'm not going to go back and read every scripture of it. Uh, but one of the prophecies is found in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 22. And God prophesies about Jehoiachin before he becomes king 
that this guy is going to have a horrible time, that he is going to be a captive of Babylon, and he is going to be reckoned childless, that he is going to have no kids, and that nothing he will do will succeed, and none of his kids will ever rule in Judah. This is kind of a bad prophecy to have hanging over your head when you become king, right? You're, you're not going to succeed. You're going to be drug off to Babylon where you're going to die. And none of your kids are going to make it. None of them are ever going to rule. You're the last king, essentially. This is it. Kind of a rough scenario. But he's got one other prophecy hanging over his head as well. And it's the fact that Jeremiah and some of the other prophets have been going through the city and telling people that if you surrender to Babylon then you'll live. That if you surrender, you'll find grace, and you'll live. Now, it says Jehoiachin was a wicked king. I don't know what he did. He was 18 years old, but apparently he messed up bad already. <laughs> but the amazing thing is, instead of him getting it together, trying to find pride, trying to fight back, he does the most humble thing possible. And when the king of Nebuchadnezzar comes out, he goes out and he selflessly and sensibly surrenders. And the second lesson, or sorry, before I get to that, sorry, got a little ahead of my notes. This isn't something I preached before. But the crazy thing that happens with this is that when he surrenders, instead of the kingdom getting wiped out, 10,000 of the people of his kingdom are saved. He gets hauled back, he gets put in prison. But if you keep reading the end of the story with Jehoiachin, what happens is he doesn't become childless, but he actually has five sons. And one of those sons becomes a guy named Zerubbabel. And I'm sorry to throw all these big names for you and all this, but he actually becomes a ruler in Judah later on. And not only that, but Jehoiachin is in the lineage of Jesus Christ. That he has sons that go on and on and eventually, he becomes the father, in a sense, of the king of kings. Now, what happened there, right? God gave a prophecy that you're going to be childless, you won't succeed, and none of your kids will ever be king. And yet, we see that this guy gets blessed with children. He gets blessed with the lineage. And some of, some of them do rule. There's a mystery there. And the answer is, the reason I believe God gave him grace, the mystery is, why did God give him that grace? And the reason, I believe, is because he surrendered. That he selflessly and sensibly surrendered. Guys, I, be I believe that surrender can be our greatest step of faith. The step of surrender often can be our greatest step of faith. Amen? How many of y'all have experienced that in your life? <laughs> give you a, just an event from my life, and I can talk about a lot of them. <laughs> But some of you guys that are on Facebook might have seen that this last week I had my uh, had a birthday. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And the awesome thing about my birthday is that my daughter, Saber, was born on my birthday. And she was born four years ago on my birthday. And when she was born, a lot of you know the story. A lot of you gave money to help us and prayed for us. But when she was born, she had a tumor about the third of the size of her head. And it had a propensity to rupture. And she would hemorrhage and bleed all the time from it. And for the first three months of her life, we thought we were going to lose her almost every day. She would almost bleed to death in our arms all the time. And I'll remember when we got to the end of that trial, one of the most surrendering moments of my life was when we went to the operating room. And we had my little baby girl. At that point, I was holding compression on her head because she was bleeding right there in my arms. And I handed her to a surgeon who immediately tried to hold compression on her to take do a surgery that would hopefully save her life. And I've had people say to me, oh, the doctor saved your baby and stuff. I want to tell you, if you were walking through that experience with us, you guys can relate. There were lots of times when the doctors almost killed my baby. <laughs> I love them. Praise God for what they've done. Praise the Lord for it. But I know that they're not God. <laughs> and I know they can make mistakes. And lots of times they did. And at that point, I wasn't surrendering my daughter to a doctor but I was surrendering her into the hands of God. And it was there I found grace, and God blessed us, and he saved her. And I have a healed girl, praise the Lord. Guys, it's the same thing I believe right here with King Jehoiachin. I don't think he's surrendering himself to King Nebuchadnezzar. 
But because of the prophecy, he knows he's throwing himself into the hands of God, saying, God, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what this guy's going to do to me, but I can't do it on my own. Here I am. Guys, often a step of surrender can be our greatest step of faith. Amen? Amen. And so here's my challenge to you this morning. Are there things in your life you still need to surrender? Are there things that you're fighting hard to run and control? Guys, I want to challenge you. Surrender. Let God have control. Whatever that looks like, you know it. But allow him to have control. Amen? Let's go ahead and let's read our last passage. This is also about King Jehoiachin. And it's in 2 Kings chapter 25, starting in verse 27. And this is the very, very last scripture in the book of 2 Kings. So the whole book, and this is how it ends. And it says in 2 Kings chapter 25, verse 27, In the 37th year of the exile of King Jehoiachin of Judah, in the year of evil Merodach, Became, he became king of Babylon, and he released Jehoiachin from prison on the 27th day of the 12th month. He spoke kindly to him and gave him a seat of honor higher than those of the other kings who were with him in Babylon. So Jehoiachin put aside his prison clothes and for the rest of his life ate regularly at the king's table. Day by day, the king gave Jehoiachin a regular allowance as long as he lived. Now, this is cool. This is a significant thing, right? Because, again, let's go back to the prophecy. He said he would die childless. He wouldn't have any sons that would be king, and he wouldn't succeed at any point in his life. That's what the prophecy said. But here we see, now 37 years later, so he's 55 years old, something amazing happens, and out of nowhere, he's pulled out of prison. He's set free, and not only that, but God gives him a seat of honor where he's above all the other kings, that are in that kingdom, other than, obviously, the king of Babylon himself. And he's blessed. He's given things. He's given, basically, a ration, a, a portion to live on. Guys, this is an amazing thing that happened, right? Now, I want to give you just a little bit of historical data. If any of y'all are Haley's Handbook people or, like, archaeology, this is just a really cool nugget. Do you realize that they actually found, when they were digging up the ruins of Babylon, that they found one tiny little clay tablet and on it, it actually had the prison report for King Jehoiachin on it. That this isn't something the Bible just made up, but they actually found the proof of this. And it has listed his five different sons he had. And it says everything that the king allotted for him to have. Awesome, right? <laughs> Absolutely true. It found that. Now, I want you to realize the significance of this. Why would he be set free? It's, it's defying what we think God wants for him, right? There's no logical reason that Babylon would all of a sudden be nice to him. This is a minute mystery. This is my third mystery of story. Why was Jehoiachin unexplainably set free and honored? And the answer, I believe, is because of four radical Jewish people <laughs> and one crazy king. Here's what I'm going. How many of y'all have heard of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? Right? They said, we're going to honor our God no matter what. They were thrown in a fiery furnace by King Nebuchadnezzar, and what happened? God saved him, and he saw the glory of God and was like, wow, this guy is real, right? Fourth guy, Daniel. Heard of him, right? Daniel does all these awesome miracles, or God uses them, the same kind of thing. But the cool thing, in Daniel chapter 4, I'm just going to refer to this, we see that Daniel is close with the king, and the king has this horrible dream. He doesn't know what's going to happen. Daniel goes and interprets the dream and gives him a prophecy, King Nebuchadnezzar, because you think you're God. God's going to show you're not. And you're going to go crazy, and for seven years, you're going to think you're gonna, a wild animal. You're going to be dejected as king. And all this happened. when he came back, he said he honored God, Jehovah God, as the one true living God. Awesome, right? So God orchestrated these things. But here's what's even cooler. It says, during the reign of evil Maraduk, this is Nebuchadnezzar's son. And again, thank you for going with me on this crazy Bible adventure. I know these are a lot of big names here. But his son, named Evil Marduk, becomes king. And it says as soon as he becomes king, he pulls Jehoiachin out of prison, and he honors him and blesses him and does all this good stuff on him. Now, why did he do that? Well, we've seen all these things that Evil Marduk has seen happening with his dad, right? 
how the Jehovah God showed off and does this. And then he sees that his dad gets this prophecy from Daniel, this Jewish guy, and then he goes nuts. And he disappears for seven years. Well, who becomes king while he disappears for seven years? Most likely his son, Evil Marduk. He just sees what God did to his dad. That'd be a pretty good reason to honor the God of the Hebrews, right? To pull him out, <laughs> to bless him, and show, hey, Jehovah God, don't mess with me the way you did to my dad, with my dad. <laughs> the cool thing, when you study this person in history, there's not a lot of details about him in history, but one of the few things that I think are interesting is that, number one, historians, historians can't agree on how long he was king. Some people say he was king for 18 years. Some people say he was king for 25 and the second thing that's interesting, nobody has any knowledge why. They can't understand it, but they know that Nebuch he somehow became king while his dad was still alive, while Nebuchadnezzar was alive. And then his dad, ah, Nebuchadnezzar, imprisoned him for a while for becoming king while he was alive. Why would that happen? Because Nebuchadnezzar was crazy for seven years. When he came back, he restored it. But God had already used his son to bless Jehoiachin. Awesome, isn't it? All right, so that's the mystery there. So here's my point with this. What's the last day's lesson for all this? The last day's lesson is that even in our consequence, God is able to orchestrate grace for us. Amen? Even in our consequence, God can still orchestrate grace. What if God is going to show his judgment for this nation? Well, my hope is that even in that, God can show his grace for us in an amazing, miraculous ways give you one um, correlation from my own life from the last couple weeks. I didn't want to share this, but I'm going to because it's a very embarrassing thing for me. <laughs> and Allegra knows what I'm talking about. But how many of you guys hunted uh, during rifle season this year? Anybody at all? All right. Anybody get a deer? All right. I got one. I was really excited. Uh, but before deer season, um, I, I, I had heard from somebody close to me that, hey, um, they had told me they would gotten a property owner tag and that because if you own five acres or more that you can get a free deer tag. I thought, oh, that's cool. Well, do I qualify that? And he's like, do you have five acres? I'm like, well, technically, yeah, because I have like seven lots at Rocky Ridge. And so I went to the lady that gives you the, t the deer tags and stuff at Buckeyes and said, hey, do I qualify for a landowner permit? And she's like, well, how much land do you own? I said, well, I just bought another lot, so technically I have five acres. And she's like, yeah, that's great. Let me, let me give this to you. And I'm like, Okay, great. So I went home, and I hunted, and I thought, this is awesome. I just got a free deer tag right now. We're expecting a baby. We're watching our budget, and I got free $17. Praise the Lord. That's how I looked at it. And so I went out and hunted on my dad's property, which is not far from us at all, kind of across the road. And I shot a doe, and I telechecked it. And the next morning, while I'm cutting up the deer in the kitchen, the game warden knocks on my door. <laughs> And he walks into me, and I'm excited. I'm, hey, come look at my deer. <laughs> and I, I, he asked me all these questions, and I tell him everything honestly. And I tell him, and he's like, well, where did you shoot it? Well, I'm, I shot it over on my parents' place, right over the way, not too far. He says, oh, you can't do that. It's illegal. He said, that's a property owner tag. You have to shoot it on your property in order to get the deer. I was like, oh, no. And so I go out, and he gives me a $113 ticket. And so I go from just praising the Lord, I got a deer, praise the Lord, I got a deer tag, to, oh, God, why? <laughs> and you know what? I, I'm not blaming it. I messed up. <laughs> I should have read the fine print. I should have understood. I deserve that. But you know what? God still gave me grace because after the game warden left, about 15 minutes later, he shows up and gives me a big butterball turkey. <laughs> Four days later, he comes and knocks on my door at about... 7 or 8 o'clock at night, right after we get our jammies on and everything, he's like, hey, you want another deer? <laughs> and he gives me, like, a deer that's got, like, 75 pounds of meat on it. And we cut up deer until we were sick of cutting up deer. Um, you know, and, and again, I had a consequence. I'm going to have to deal with that. But God gave me grace I didn't deserve. And that's the thing about our God, is that even in our consequence, he can orchestrate grace. And so, my question is, <laughs> Is there anything you need grace for in your life right now? Guys, no matter where you've done, what you've done, where you've been, it's not too late for him to do that. Just turn your heart to him. So let me be the good school teacher again, kind of wrap this up. I'm going to give you the recap. <laughs> and so in our story, we had two kings. So who was our first king in the story? 
Josiah, right? And what was the mystery with Josiah? The mystery was he was supposed to die in peace, right? But God allowed him to die in war. And the last day's lesson is I believe God can adjust his response to us based on our response to him. Second king in our story, what was his name? Big crazy one, right? Jehoiachin, thank you, good job. Jehoiachin. And the mystery, why was it that he had sons when God said he was going to be childless? Why was it that his sons, who weren't supposed to ever be king, even led to being basically the lineage of Jesus Christ? Because he surrendered. Because a step of surrender can be our biggest step of faith. For the third mystery in our story, Jehoiachin's release. And the lesson we can learn from this is that in even our consequence, God can orchestrate grace for us. And here's my final thought I want to give you as I close. You guys know what we do. You know that we go across the country, we tell people Jesus is coming soon. Time is short. And we say this in prisons, and we say this all over the country. Why do we do that? Because we want all the people in America to go hide out in the hills and be preppers for the end times? No. We do that because... Our God is a God who can give grace. And that if we respond to him, he will respond favorably to us, favorably toward us. That he's a God that if we just surrender, he can change everything. That he is a God that can give us grace even in our consequence. Let's respond to him this morning, amen? And let's bring that message to this world around us. Let's pray. Father God, I just thank you so much for your word, for how rich it is on every page, God. And God, I just pray this morning you would help us to fall more and more in love with you. And God, help us to have that mindset that time is short. You are coming soon. Your judgment is coming, God. And so God, help us to be bold with your gospel to this world around us. And so God, we just thank you again for this day. And we give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, God bless you all. Thanks for letting us share.